welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host, Gary Vayner Chuck. And this, my friends, is The Thunder Show, AKA the internet's most passionate wine program. And you know, we've gone from a episode with cereal in it, Mott, to uh, a wild and crazy uh, New Zealander. Now we're gonna get a little bit more refined. We're gonna class up the show, and I appreciate Adrian for doing that for us. And we're gonna talk about a a very special bottle of wine, but we're really gonna talk a little bit about investment and collecting. Uh, Adrian, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, thanks a lot, Gary. And why don't you tell the Vayner Nation who you are and uh, why you were interested in being on the show and the kind of things we wanna talk about today. Okay, well, thanks, Gary. Um, My name's Adrian Lennigan. I'm from Providence Fine Wines. We're a company in England, and what we do is we specialize in managing people's portfolios of wine. You know, for the purposes of them collecting it and selling it down the line, you know, investment for want of a better word. And obviously in the UK and in London and Europe in general, it's a little bit more of an open market than we have here in the US and it's more of a common thing to happen over there than here where it's a little bit clunkier because people can't ship and the way wine's traded, Mm. hopefully that's opening up. Obviously auction houses are about and around and plenty of people do trade wine in the US, but it is more of a common action over in the UK. It used to be considered really exotic. You know, as you know, uh, it used to be considered quite ridiculous to collect wine for the purposes of selling it at a later date. These days, with the advent of things like um, the London International Vintners Exchange, there's a lot more transparency, and there's a lot more people considering it, you know, really quite mainstream. Sure. Uh, to uh, have alongside their, you know, uh, other elements of their investment uh, cash. Whether it's in the market or art or real estate. Absolutely. Um, okay. And the good thing that happened when Parker came along, he mm-hmm. objectified the wine market to some extent. You know, whether you love him or you loathe him, he is there. He's a huge, huge influence. And what he has done these days is he has really he set the benchmark. So that if you do want to invest in wine, you really need to look at his scorings. What? No question. We feel it on the retail side. Mm. Where? Where? Do you see the market going that you've opened up that can of worms? I mean, he's a human being, right? He is. Um, and he's not 25. Luckily, he's still a young guy. But he can't fundamentally. Right. None of us can be around forever. Of course. What do you think the impact of Parker's, whether he retires or hopefully he goes to he's 150, but one day you mm. know he's out of the market, what do you think happens to the wine market? It's a good question because it's one we get asked a lot. You know, our clients ask him, what if he dies? You know, there's no point uh, beating around the bush. He's not going to be around forever. And he is very influential, but... Especially on this pre... I'm sorry to interrupt. No, especially, because I'm going to get yelled at for that. Especially <laughs> uh, for the premium, premium market. Yeah. Where the, the kind of dollars, I mean, we feel it. For our top 90 clients who all, you know, spend, you know, heavy five figures into six figures mm. a year in wine... I mean, that Parker score is their insurance policy. Absolutely, absolutely. But as we've seen happen, you know, the Lafitte 82, 100 point wine, right? Great, great wine, great collectible wine, sells for 25,000 pounds at auction. Uh, Recently got downgraded to a 97. Not the blindest, but a difference. Once a wine achieves a certain age and a certain level of uh, quality and demand. But downgraded it's be by there. him. By him, yes. So that's him. the important distinction there, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have not seen, and wine, at least in the U.S., we have not seen it continue to move the needle from, Pat, you know, Hugh Johnson, Flanagan. I mean, there's yeah. been names prior to Parker. Mm. Obviously, nobody has ever achieved this status. It's going to be a very dynamic question. But it, but it will change. Yeah, you it know? will. You're here. Well, I don't know if I really, you know, I appreciate that. Yeah, very I know, kind, you, get, but... you know, you're on the front page of the New York Times yesterday. <laughs> yes, that was exciting. And um, Robert, Robert Parker's influence, although it is huge, it's not going to be there forever. He is going to. But my uh, whole thing is, don't listen to me. Sure, sure. You know, sure. I mean, and, and yeah, my your whole philosophy is different. Yeah. It really is, especially when it comes to I love the great. I mean, look, we have this amazing Burgundy here, mm. which I'm glad to see that you haven't had much experience with it. So I think you're going to like it. Um, and I love what Latour brings to the table. Yeah, but. What I'm more passionate about is getting people to really trust themselves and two, to try different things. That's really, you know, I want to debate why can a Bordeaux get 100 points? Why can't the best Rieslings in the world get 100 points? Absolutely. Why can't the great Chinon producer? You know, so, I mean, you know, if God forbid anybody listens to me, but that being said, um, I do think that the web itself with sites like Corked and you know Seller mm. Tracker and things of that nature, not just Smile because he knows the forum guys are gonna make fun of me for Corked, are gonna give that aggregate score model. It, there'll definitely be voices, whether it's one person or a community. Yeah, sure. There's the collecting of wine and the rarity and the interest level 
from places like China and Asia, especially and, and huge, Russia. Huge. That's gonna, you know, they can't make much more of this. No, absolutely. That's this what is it's all about supply that, and so, demand. So, this, if you understand the pure economics of it, mm-hmm. it's a very intriguing investment, especially because not only is there supply and demand, there's only 500 cases of this. Now it's not just about the UK and the US, Asia, Russia. You know, collectors popping up in Australia, New Zealand. Now all clamoring for the same thing. Yeah. Some of it actually gets consumed too. Yeah, I know. Yeah, G- Let's unbelievable. Not it. Let's not forget it. Go figure. Um, so that's very fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. You know what we've seen over the years um, in the European side of things is that whilst it is very much the the top level Bordeaux's and and, and certain other wines that really get the notice, it's what off- are the certain other wines? Are, are Super Tuscans coming out? Sessakayas yeah. and Sessakaya, Salaisa. Yeah, is de- will, will is high end ports still move? Less Port, and less, Port's right? It's a strange one, but we're probably not seeing it so much at the no. moment. Um, it's you, really collapsed in the last 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 94 port in the US, I had somebody threaten to punch me in the face if I didn't get him six bottles of Taylor. Really? I mean, the emotions it's were slightly huge. extreme. That was on the extreme side, but you know, I, I understand that style. Um, what really surprises me is that virtually no collector mentions port to me now. No, it's true, um, but it's, it's fashion, isn't it? Sure. It's fashion. It sure, it isn't is. fashionable. You know, the other thing I think they did wrong is they declared too many vintages in a row as the best. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when you cry, will you yeah, know? I mean, true. you know, not everything can be the greatest vintage ever. Absolutely. Um, other regions, you know, I'd be interested to hear what you think. Some of the top Australians still early days They've collapsed in the U.S. The premium. I mean, you still get the Hill of Grace and the Grange. Yeah, it's that maybe can, four or five wines. It's gone it. back, right? Yeah, Hasn't yeah, it? Yeah. But um, but it's certainly an interesting time because you know we're seeing more and more people do it. Companies like myself, we're, having, we're using, we're wanting to use more and more different marketing techniques. It's, you know, obviously we love what you do. Uh, we love the social media side of things, and it's England, right? It's pretty, it's pretty staid. Europe's pretty staid. How much does Jancis command in the UK market respect from the high end collectors? She's, because her respect level in the world is, I might think, is the single. I mean, I don't know. I think Jancis is probably this uh, within the trade. Probably the single most respected critic in the world. Within the trade, I think that's very, very important. But the important. consumers, but not. the consumers, perhaps not so much. You know, she's certainly revered think, in in the country. Do you, do you think that if she went away from the twenty point scale and went to the hundred point scale, that it could have an impact? She'd be reluctant, though, wouldn't she? Right? Yeah, I mean, she said it here in the show that you know it's that's the way she scored, or maybe she said that over tea when we had it. <laughs> I don't remember, but I, I respect it immensely. Um, do you think that the common collector needs that distinction between a 99 and 98 and 97 and 96 and that 18, 19 and 20 don't do it for them? I think that in reality the 20 point scale with its allowance for um, a bit more subtlety because it makes, it makes you look past the number. You know, it makes yeah. you look into the words which themselves, which is very, very important and you know, that's why she's reluctant to uh, relinquish that certainly. But people want numbers. They want what they consider to be objectivity. And that's what numbers pr- provide, right? Sure. You know, so people will say, well, it's a 97 and that's a 96. And will they'll, a tw- they'll will think a, it's better 20, and it might not be. Will a 20 of 20, but how often does she go that extreme? Rarely, right? Very, very rarely. Yeah. Will a 20 of 20, which I knew, which, will a 20 of 20 move the market for you guys? Uh, I would think so, yeah, definitely. She goes but and gives 07 Sesakaya 20 of 20. Do you think you feel it? Well, what do you, what do you, I'm interested to hear what you think over this side of well, the Atlantic. Her, her presence in the U.S. is respected, but we don't feel it on the no. consumer side the way we do with many other entities. I think, yeah, Which is I sad, which is something yeah. I'm like trying to figure out. I'm like, I'm like, I DM'd her on Twitter last night. Like, <laughs> we gotta get, I mean, because she's lovely and she's highly respected. Yeah. And, um, she's a force, uh, and I think she's got an amazing palette. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what happens. I, I don't know. I mean, I think the the sexy thing to say is that more people care about, you know, what I say and I'm the hot ticket. But I just don't see that. I, I not especially the way I'm positioned. Sure, sure. You, know, I mean, you don't you don't want to be. I don't want that it. influence. You I want, don't want it. You know, you want people to go out there and do it themselves, which is great. It's a very very different thing. It is. But on the on the high end, when you start getting into these, you know, six seven figure peeps. Um, mm. There's definitely going to be several voices. I, I don't see people. You know, I, I think that's going to still stay for quite a long time. Absolutely. And talking about you know the real high end at the moment, Bordeaux 2008, the mm-hmm. Unpremier campaign that just happened was very very interesting because the there was an organisation in England called the LiveX, London International mm-hmm. Vintners Exchange, and they've always been calling for more and more transparency. And it seems that the Bordeaux negotiation, you know, it's not it's not what they want really. It's not their DNA. And uh, and and Parker. You know, he he scores the wines, um, and 
there is some talk of you know they want independent verification of tasting samples. I'd, I'd really be interested to hear what you think about well, I think, all of I that. Think, I think that I think that uh, transparency is awesome. I mean, I think one of the things that works for this show is that um, listen, I'm probably the least position for people to trust because I have a retail store and that's not the American culture to listen to your retailer. You know, it's the old days, 50s and 40s and mm. you know, trust your local retailer, the butcher yeah. will, will give you the best piece yeah, absolutely, of meat. Yeah. But what I think has really worked is that I taste for the first time in front of them and I don't edit. And mm. I'm not really capable of hiding my emotions as they know. So I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that if, if anything that makes things more transparent, I mean, if Parker, mm reviewed every one of his Bordeaux sample 2009s on video, on live stream, that'd be powerful. Be incredible. You know, you, you know you, you'd have a much better sense of how he does it, where he does it. Yeah. Um, I respect that. Listen, uh, 2008s is very fascinating. Parker, Absolutely. Parker is probably higher on 08 Bordeaux than anybody in the world. Yeah, and it was a massive, massive shock. You know, we, you're right, we all heard it was, I mean, I, I'm very down on the vintage. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody <laughs> was. Everybody said it's a moderate vintage, it's a great vintage, it's not a speculator's vintage. Uh, certainly, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a decent And then the big gorilla business. comes in and says, yeah, of course, you know, not you to know? call you gorilla, Mr. Park, because I know you watch every <laughs> night. I mean, meaning, you know, the biggest voice and the most powerful voice, especially in Bordeaux, there's really no second voice. Yeah. Um, decanter to a degree. Yeah. But, but, I mean, he's a real juggernaut when it comes to Bordeaux. And look at what happened to the price. You know, the Lafitte sure. overnight doubled in price. It's... It, it took everybody by surprise, you know. It certainly took us by surprise, and we, you know, it's it's not that easy to buy on Premier wines of uh, of decent quantities anyway. How many competitors do you have uh, in the UK market? It's a competitive industry, but you know, we we want to be we want to be up there and doing something slightly different because let's face it, what we're doing isn't hugely different from other people. Um, we are recommending wines for people to lay down. Uh, there's lots of companies much older than ours who've done that for quite a while, but hopefully we're doing a few things differently, like um, what? like talking to you for a start. Um, by using the internet and using um, you know a, a bit of personality to create a sense of community, um, and I know that's you know something that you've yes. you know cracked to, to I, a huge degree. That's what I love, yeah. but I mean it's, it's about loving the peeps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but when you're dealing with a, a, an industry like uh, we're it's within, a different it's you know, a different it's, it's, an inv it's an investment industry and it's big money. It is. It's huge. It's not, and it's, you know, people aren't dropping eight dollars. No, exactly. Do you have a minimum? Uh, generally, cases will start at around three thousand pounds. Yeah, yeah. You know, to get a case that will meet the criteria. Well, you take a client who wants to buy one case of a three thousand pound feet. Of course. Yeah, well, so then, not? so then it's it's there's a line, but it's not this fifty thousand minimum investment to get in. Like you'll get with funds and That's things right. like that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, okay. no, we've got quite a few clients who've, who've done that. That's good. And, you know, they, they I think that's a, that's important. Yeah, yeah. So it is accessible. Do, does everybody have to buy by the case? Yeah, generally, if you go. But that's the right way to go about anyway yeah. as a collector. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't really invest in something if it's a broken case. You know, you've got yeah. to buy the case minimum. We're seeing actually more and more six bottle cases being yeah. produced within Bordeaux. Well, you know, I mean, the global. You know. Let's talk about what happened to your business when the financial global economic collapse or, or dent or whatever you want to call what happened last yeah. September. How much have you guys felt it? Well, the Livex index, which is the popular index for the 100 leading fine wines that are investable, shall we say, it dropped by 15, 18%, you know, which fine not wine, that bad. it's not that bad, but fine wine is generally never considered to be a market that has suffered when other markets have. That's um, right. So it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a shock, but it's recovered very well and it's doing, you know, some of the Lafitte prices are higher than they were even last summer, you know, it's incredible. What, what? do you think is, if at all, is the opportunity in the US? Or is this a market you guys are thinking about trying to get involved or are laws so archaic and difficult that it's almost not worth your time yeah. at this point? As you as you know, the laws are pretty prohibitive. You know, I use that word obviously advisedly because you know, yeah. it's, that's what it all They're disgusting. stemmed from. And um, it's tricky because it's a very, very different market to Europe because you, know, you have the US slip labels issue uh, it means that the markets are very, very separate. I mean, you've got things like Vinfolio now. Right, creating can, the marketplace. Yeah, I can mention that, right? Yo, yeah, let's yeah, yeah. I'm thinking mention Zackies and Sherry Lehman's <laughs> and Sam's, and you can mention every store I, and I keep forgetting I'm not in England that it's not the BBC, you know? You can, yeah, <laughs> this is not the BBC, and more importantly, whereas so many people worry about that stuff, I'm, you know, I want, you know, yeah. ironically, I want everybody to win. Yeah. I'm not super worried. One, I know I'm better. And two, um, there's room for everybody. Absolutely, you know, we. I talk about our competitors. I say to clients and prospective clients of ours, go check out Berry Brothers and Rudd. You yeah. know, yes, they are the oldest wine merchant in the world, and they're great, and we're great friends of them. But um, 
you know, have a look at us as well. Look at other competitors, see if you're happy. Because I think that, you know, these days you've, you've got to be able to do that, right? Yeah, I mean, we're living in a, a, a transparent world. Mm. You know, mm. nobody's uh, nobody's confused what's out there. Sure. Consumers are smarter than ever. Yeah, the days when you could stitch someone up, as we say, you know. And there's no the value, number. because even if you could stitch someone up, which I like, I'll start mm -hmm. using that, um, you're going to get exposed. Yeah. And every consumer quickly. has a bigger voice than they have ever had before mm. with their Twitter and Facebook accounts. I mean, you know, I've retweeted to a million people something somebody who has 45 followers have said. Yeah. So, you know, things like that. Absolutely. Access um, is what it's all about. You know, I think Vinfolio, you know, great guys. I love I love Stephen Bach. Yeah. You know, Bachman. I mean, they're just good people and I, I, I hope they win. Mm. I hope because I, you know, I hope that that marketplace concept works. And there's issues, of course, and like provenance, lot. and you there's know, a it's... lot of issues. But Wine Commune has done it for a long time yeah. at some level. Wine Bid. Yeah. I mean, there's been players in the U.S. Mm. who've done it on a bottle to bottle level. Yeah. I don't think exactly the same way. I think the case level is the real investment play. Sure. And there's no in the U.K. There's no consumer end version. Do you have of that. U.S. customers buying? From you guys, we don't have so much. No, we. But we, do people? I mean, there people, are some. Right? People do do it. I mean, people. Do you can, store the wine for customers? We do. We store it in, in a separate location. There's, so in theory, I'm, I'm, it could do. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason why not. You know, they except could, the dollars week. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> that, but, that's know, the big reason. But it'll change, and you know, it always sure. changes, and it'll change back again. And you know, it's just diversity. It's just have something different. That's what that's what people say. More and more, the press in the UK are starting to really sort of take now, notice. Now, are you an entrepreneur or is wine a passion of yours? Is it a little bit of both? Where, where does that all break down? I'd say first and foremost, Gary, I'd have to be honest, I am an entrepreneur, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to work um, in the film business, uh, which was great. It was great fun and I got to travel and all, all of those things. You know, I wasn't, it wasn't very glamorous for me personally. You know, I wasn't doing anything hugely exciting. You weren't than, acting in it. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I was, but I was doing a lot of observing and I got to meet a lot of different people and it was very, very exciting almost from a, you know, a kind of, by default, just being around that kind of thing. Sure. And, um, and I met a girl on a film set and we thought, we, you know, I, I don't want to work in an industry where she's over this side of the world and I'm over that side of the world, so she got a different job and I got a different job. And we settled Good in London you. and, you know, the rest is history. Um, awesome. Hello, Justine and Evie, of course. Of course. I had a daughter not too long ago. As Congratulations, yeah, yes, yeah. little Misha. How, how old is your daughter? She's uh, 17 months. Congratulations. Thank it's you. getting to that cool zone, right? Yeah, she's just getting really fun. Yeah, yeah I can't good. wait for Misha to be sitting here and entertaining the baby. Well, what is she now? Four? She's five three months. months. Three months. Oh, okay. oh, she's on her way to four. Yeah, cool. 16 weeks, so it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. So, um, so yeah, I, I got a job in an industry uh, where I was able to get on. and I, It's not a hugely complicated industry. It's about building a network of contacts and making sure that you can buy wine at a price that makes it viable for investment. And uh, I was able to do that to some small degree, and you know, set up the business. And so, what made you make that jump? I mean, was like, did you have some intrigue in wine? It was it was the industry that I fell into, and I found it very interesting. Uh, the collecting aspect of it, yeah. you know, I'm not going to sit are here and say. Are you a collector at heart? I think I am a collector at heart. Yeah. I was a big fan of Star Wars figures, you know, back in the day. Nice. Um, you know, all the. Did you keep them all... in package? I didn't. No, I open. Yeah, yeah. I did. yeah. yeah. Huge mistake. You know, and then my mother gave them all away, but that's another story. And um, Devastating. And so, yeah, I suppose a collector at heart. Because um, that's what brought me into wine, too. Really? Yeah, I was very much into, you know, Star Wars figures, baseball cards, comic yeah, course, books, yeah. all this stuff. And then when I realized people collected wine, but I think maybe more unlike you, then I dove into it at 16 and just mm. read and devoured you know, and then really when I could start tasting on a serious level at 21, I spent those seven years just tasting and tasting and tasting. Mm. And I think, you know, as you well know, if you're going to do something, you've got to really throw yourself completely into it. And yeah, um, sure. and so once you do that, then I decided, yeah, I've got to, uh, it's about control, isn't it? I, w I wanted to have more control, and I saw that it was something that I could be successful uh, within, but also other people could be as well, because I know this is something that's close to you as well. You know, you could sell wine to anybody. And you could sell a lot, a lot of wine to a lot of people, and you couldn't really, you know, in another universe, you might not care about what they think about it. You could still do very, very well out of sure. it. I could do very well recommending investment caliber wine. Uh, also, I could conceive it to be, and it might not be, but what's the point? Where's the longevity? You need to have one eye on, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years. And, you know, we wouldn't work as a business if that wasn't the case. I think it's massively fascinating. Has it brought you into tasting more and more fine wine? Yeah, well, you know, I, that's a perk, right? Yeah, absolutely. You have to do it, and we have a lot of tastings ourselves uh, back in London, and we invite our clients to come and meet each other because that's how you know they get to a sense of 
ways of collecting and levels of collecting and you know you've got the guy there who's got the one one case of Aubrey on 98 which he purchased for maybe two and a half thousand pounds and you've got a guy who's got you know considerably more than that sure so um so yeah there's there's a, there's a lot to be said for bringing those people together that community and, is a lot of fun yeah and wine of course that's what it's all about no question so let's get into the wine mm. since that's what it's all about uh the la pu d'or corton clauderie 2006 85 bones uh, 93 points, Alan Meadows, the Burghound. Uh, if you don't know who the Burghound is and you like Burgundy, uh, you're making a massive mistake. Uh, Alan is, uh, talk about somebody who will probably have an impact. Uh, if I had to mm. roll the dice and bet on somebody uh, impacting the market, I believe that Mr. Meadows will impact the Burgundy market over the next five to 15 to 20 years quite a bit. Mm. And considering that I believe Burgundy will continue to gain momentum as a collector's item, I'm sure you've seen a lot of that. Yeah, of course, you know, but he's considered very much an expert's market. Oh, you know, it is the market. Expert collector's it is market. The, it's the market. Yeah. Um, this is something I'm very excited about trying. 06 is very solid vintage. De this wine is definitely too young, but at 85 bones, a very attractive price point for a very attractive uh, uh, con uh, producer. That, you know, They make some of the more interesting wines in the world. So... Um, Let's give it a snippy sniff. What is your experience with uh, Pinot Noir and Burgundy? Are you a fan or anti-fan? I'm not an anti-fan. I know it's it's getting getting fan. It's getting fashionable to be an anti-fan. Yeah, believe. it really is. So, big ass glass, which is exciting. On, on the nose, you get a really ripe cherry component. Very dark kind of black cherry flavor. You don't get the stinky vibe. You don't get the no. barnyard that a lot of people. Expect, but when you get to the core tone, you get this kind of flavor profile. You, you get more subtle fruit a lot of times. Uh, it's a very young and vibrant vintage. There's a little floral component as well that I like quite a bit, a little bit like a red flower thing. Let's give it a whirl. What do you think about this wine? Yeah, I mean, as a, as a, don't remember. I could care less where you go. No, with this. I I appreciate that. You know, and you've been very upfront the whole time. So yeah, just I mean, rail it or love it. No, I do like it. I'm not I'm not a huge fan of it. I'm not gonna. Is it too thin on the back end for you? No, I think it's not. It. I think as you say, it probably is slightly young. It's more than slightly young. Yeah. Um. So, I'm not overcome. I'm not overcome either either way. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I'm someone. I think you talk about it in a chapter of your book. Uh, you talk about. All of the people who have considered themselves eventually really expert in, in tasting wine, they all, at one st stage in their life, still cons consider themselves to be, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can do this, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm probably there still. Yeah, I respect that. You know? I mean, you, how long have you been doing this? Well, tasting wine in, sure, in this, I mean, in this way, in, what, five, six years, something yeah, like I that, mean, you know, at a decent level. And I, st I still think, you know... There's, there's a lot I have to learn about tasting Well, we wine. all do. I mean, yeah. even all the way up to the, you know, I can promise you right now, we can talk about a category of wine, whether it's Greek white wines mm. or or subtle, obscure varietals from Italy or Portugal that even the greats from, you know, Jancis and Robert Parker are still not in a, in a place where they're comfortable because it's mm. not what they consume often. I can imagine for you, you know, clarets is something you're more comfortable with than, let's say, Tokai Fruliano. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean I, there's varietals you have never even probably had yet. I, absolutely. Yeah, so. I mean, I, ironically, you know, there's a lot of uh, claret and there's a lot of uh, that around that we do have at our tastings. But personally, I'm a big, you know, a big fan of the fruit forward Shiraz is coming from yeah. Rosa Valley. Yeah, you know, I go hear figure. It's, it's, it's No, listen, a, it's funny. My palate's moving back towards bigger fruit as well. Let me break this down for them. I know yeah. we're having fun. Um, really bitter on the back end. You, you get some of that green stem kind of thing going on. So it's a little disjointed. It's extremely young. But you can't deny the power. It's kind of like the 11-year-old at 6'1 that plays in a Little League World Series. Or... You know, you can't deny it's going somewhere. Melody Udan. I don't know if you caught this whole phenomenon. The little spunky, you know, 17-year-old from Georgia who caused a lot of ruckus at the U.S. Open. She got her butt beaten the other night, Ma, but you clearly know she's on her way to win championships because she's got a killer instinct. This wine, though awkward, and can occasionally hit the 300-foot home run, even though it's 11 years old, is going to strike out a lot. It's just too young. Uh, it's, it's disjointed. It's even... It's even showing more youth and more awkwardness and tightness than I even expected. I just recently did a bunch of 06s 
that kind of were showing fairly well. This hasn't been open long enough and nor has it been decanted, so we're not giving it a fair shot, but the elements are in place here. The fruit is very pure and focused. The structure on the mid palate is shocking. That transition fruit from the beginning up front, kind of black cherry that I taste that then goes into that kind of green floral component is seamless even at this point and that's very impressive for a wine like this. It's got clearly 12, 15, 18 years of cellar uh, ability to it and um, and I, I think it shows a lot of interesting uh, uh, potential. Let me give it one more shot. There's definitely kind of almost a slight cocoa component. Uh, also, I also get a little bit of like um, on the back end now, a um, sun-dried tomato component a little bit. I love how you do that, you know. It's, yeah. it's something that I experience at tastings a lot where someone says something and someone comes up with um, an idea and I go, you know, I was, do you think that's I power? Do you think that. it's power of, of persuasion or do you think it's just kind of like it's there? I, I don't know, like, I mean, for me it's just, it's so obvious what I'm tasting. And your, but your experience of tasting is huge, and you know we've all read about the extent to which you've gone to, to do that. You know, pretty pretty extreme again. But so. I really wish those days were still around. I was tasting like <laughs> 70, 80 wines a day. Rocks and you know, all yeah, all that it. stuff. But then when I was like twenty one, twenty two, yeah. actually, it really started happening twenty one to twenty six. Yeah, I mean, I was in a period of time there. I was tasting a lot of wine. Developing this business and sure, you know, doing doing all of that. I want to really understand. Yeah, you know, yeah. So. Great wine, I would score it 91 points here, but I'm gonna score this wine 91 question mark. Sorry, SS. Uh, I think, it's, uh, I think it's, um, it's, it's a wine that I'd love to see where it develops going forward and just really one of the most tight, almost non-breakdownable wines, if that makes any sense, which it doesn't. You know, just can't really get there yet. The shield is too powerful. It's kind of like a Star Wars reference, the Death Star. There's only there's only a little opening that Luke was able to get through. You know, that's kind of what's going on here. Um, but a, a, a very profound wine, and definitely when you talk about collectors, Le Pua, uh, Le, Le Pua is definitely a producer that a lot of people get excited about. Maybe as this wine ages, the tractor beam will uh, will go down. Yes, I think yeah. you're right. Thank you so much for being on the show. No problem at all. Is there all, anything though. you want to leave uh, the nation with? Any um, thoughts? Well, I was actually having a quick chat with Mott before you came in about. Well, um, I know he's a superstar. About, I know. I'm Did starting to realize that. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we were talking about England and about famous British exports. And of course, you know, the Beatles is, is one of the most famous ones. You know, Liverpool's very close to my heart because it's the football, sort sure. of soccer team yep. that I follow. And, um, and of course, they've just released the new remastered. Beatles albums, all of them. I know. Uh, in stereo. Amazing. So if... Uh, the Spice Girls. <laughs> yes. Would be another... An another huge export. Huge export. Okay, well, I'll expand the question slightly then. If uh, if you were to choose a Beatle um, to oh. be a wine, you know, which is John, which is George, which is Paul, which is Ringo? This is a phenomenal... So you want them in the comments section to yeah. list them and then say which wine and it is. And why, yeah. You know, maybe John's a revolutionary wine. Maybe he's, you know, who knows? You, you decide. One of the better questions, even. Gary, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks no for problem. being here. Thanks. You, with a little bit of me, we're changing the wine world.